In the first two videos, we prepared a natural pH indicator from the skin of one red apple, and then we used that indicator to test certain substances. In this video, we, we are going to do the final steps where we will be processing the results by creating a partial pH chart. Then we will think about how we can work out and name the colors of our results quite accurately. Then we will move on to think about some reflections and this is like a conclusion for our experiment. Finally, there will be a short video which is the experiment that I redid in bright daylight with a better camera angle so it's much easier to see. Enjoy! Unfortunately, I didn't get any good photos from the experiment that we, uh, Elton and I did. And this is one of the best ones that I could get, which was not really that great. So the next day, in bright sunlight, I did the experiment again, and I got some lovely results. I also did some zoomed in pictures. So you can see, for example, the lemon juice and the vinegar and the baking soda and the milk and the clothes washing detergent, and finally, the bleach. The printouts aren't that great, they're a bit dark, but that's what they are. So I printed out a pH scale that goes from zero to 14, and I'm just gonna try and make my own scale from my own indicator. The first thing I wanted to do is write down the colors that the different liquids went. So I just did that basically in a table that I made here where I've got the test substance and the different test substances. The second column is the pH that I found on the internet. The only weird one is the clothes washing detergent. Can't see that very well from the other side. But uh, also the colors are really difficult. So I just wrote basic colors, red, red, brown, pink, yellow, and yellow. Although one of them is quite a brown yellow. But anyway, now, I'm going to try and colour in my pH uh, chart here based on the numbers that I got off the internet and the colours in my pictures. The lemon juice is really red. I've got two red pens here. One's quite a bit of an orange red. Well, I think I'll use that for the vinegar. So that's about two or three. There we go, just like that. Vinegar, we can see, is about pH 4. Baking soda is quite hard. It's a bit of a brown one. I've got a, a light brown here. Good. There we are so far. The milk is a hard one. I think it looks a lot paler and more white than it, what it would. Let's go with... I have these colors here. I could, I guess I'll just use this one. So milk is about 6.6. .6, so between like six and seven. Just gonna color it somewhere in between six and seven. Okay. Clothes washing detergent. Well, the clothes washing detergent is very purpley sort of color. Something like one of these. I'm gonna actually go with this one, I think. Clothes washing detergent should be between seven and 10. So seven and 10. But actually we know that the bleach is also very, uh, is, is 13, is also very yellow. So it looks like this end of the pH scale might be quite yellow or brown. So I think I'm just gonna put this purple on the other side here. So that's what we've got so far. And then finally, we've got the bleach, which is really a little yellow, brown. I'm just gonna go with yellow, actually. And according to my table, it's pH 13. And so according to the results that I've done, that, 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 that I've got, this is my pH chart that I can use. Now I'm going to briefly look at a chart that I got off the internet. So here we can see some color charts for many natural indicators one of them being red apple skin. And the red apple skin here starts orange, it gets pink, 
And then around seven, it really starts to go yellow and it maybe gets a little bit green towards the end. Is that the same as mine? Well, if I just do this, I would say there are some similarities, but for mine, my colours were very definitely much more red towards the top. And also, somewhere around neutral, my colours were definitely not yellowy or green. There was still, still some red in them, some sort of pink and purpley colours moving on to brown, which is a, a form of orange. So I think actually the colour chart that I got off the internet is, is not a very good representation for the red apple skin. It's okay. I don't know where it came from, I don't know the source, but this is what I got in my, my, my experiment, so this is the one I'm going to trust. Here you can see our picture that I took of the results. We can see that the colour is basically red, but if we want to know the colour better than that, we can quite easily do it. So in this case, we've loaded the picture into MS Paint, which is free with Windows if you have that. And then using the tool here, which is called the Colour Picker, we can choose uh, the colour. Now you can see the colour is different in some different areas where there are some different imperfections or around the sides where the, the liquid is a bit shallower than in the middle. So I'm always going to choose from somewhere in the middle that is fairly free from perfect imperfections. When I do that, you can see that this becomes this red colour here. And then if I press edit colours, you can see that I've got lots of different colours here, but my colour is in this a rectangle here. And how do I describe that color? Well, there's two systems that it uses here. There's hue, saturation, and luminosity. But the second system is red, green, and blue. And that's because just like with lights, if we have a red and a green and a blue light, then we can create essentially any color that we can see. And these numbers next to the words go from zero, which means there's none of this color at all, to 255, which means there's the most color that you can put in. So if we had a 255, zero, zero, that would be pure red. Now, in our case, we've got 173, so we don't have f a full amount of red, and we also have a little bit of green and a, and a little bit of blue, and that is all combining together to make this colour. But we can use this representation that we're just going to call RGB to represent the colours that we find. I've al already done that process, and the numbers might be slightly different, but they're essentially going to be the same. Let's look at the table that I made. Firstly, these are the test substances on the left-hand side. In the second column are the pH values for the test substances. Then in the final column, you can see I've just called this color, and each box has the RGB values for red, green, and blue. And it also has a word or three words that I use to describe the color. And I just made that up. I just tried to describe the color in words, and it's actually quite difficult. Um, so you do try it yourself, but this is the first way that we can use to try and accurately represent the colors that we've found in our experiment. What do I mean by a reflection? Well, firstly, you need to recall a memory from your experiment and think about all of the different things that happened. And then you can ask some questions about that memory. For example, Broadly speaking, was it a success? Was it a failure? Was it easy or hard? How could I do it better? How could I do it differently? And uh, those two questions are different because maybe you think it went well, but maybe there's another method you think you could try in the future. When we start asking those questions and questions like that about our memories, that's the start of our reflections. And the answers that we give ourselves are the material that we can use to reflect on. And we can, we can start to analyze what we've done. And all of this should have some implications on the future, even if those implications are that you never want to do this experiment again. <laughs> but hopefully there are also more positive things. So I'm going to show you many of those questions, how I've reflected on memories, and I'm going to put them in two columns. So on the left, you'll see the memory. 
and on the right you'll see the reflection. So firstly, well, I remember when I went to the supermarket, I saw lots of fruit and vegetables that have strong colours. And secondly, I also remember that I was surprised by how much indicator I got from one uh, apple's skin. Now going to the supermarket, I thought it was going to be difficult to find some of these materials, but actually it was very easy. I think really this was me being quite pessimistic before I started. And I feel like it, this is reminding me that I should, I should try to be more optimistic because it really wasn't a difficult task. About the second point that I, about being surprised about how much indicator I got, well, I think this was a good experience because it really showed me practically um, that my expectations were not the same as reality. And that even with this thin skin, from one apple, I got loads of really good indicator that I could use for my experiment. This shows me the value of doing something practically. And also, you know the phrase, seeing is believing. So now that is really impressed on my mind. Another memory is that when I had finished preparing the indicator, it was all mixed in with the little pieces of um, apple. So I put it into a sieve. And then I thought, oh, I'll crush it to squeeze out any more of the juice. Another memory I recall is that boiling really helped. I could see that the more I boiled it, the colour was really coming out, the pigment. And my third memory is that I'm not sure if leaving it for a while after I boiled it, I'm not sure if that really helped. So I, I, I want to think about these three things. Firstly... Well, next time, I'm not going to crush the apple on the sieve because I think I had about 95% of the liquid. And for that extra 5% of the liquid, I have to get some impurities, some little pieces of apple, which I, I think came through the sieve. And I don't think that was worth it. Next time, well, the boiling was great. Definitely boil. And next time, I'm just going to try it differently. I think that leaving it for a long time after I boiled it did help and I think the colour just became uniform but I would like to try it uh, the other way as well and then maybe next time I could try two experiments uh, one where I just take the indicator after fairly soon after boiling and one where I leave it for a while and I can see which one gives me a better indicator. I remember that I was doing it at night time and the lighting was not so good and it was in this uh, location if you recognize it. And I remember when I watched the video back I, I felt like I was directing my little boy quite strongly. This is something that's very difficult for me because of having my children so around the daytime it's very difficult to film with them and so that's why I was filming at night is especially because my little girl, and, and if I was doing it with Eldon, that's okay, but doing it with my little girl, it would have been very difficult to, to do that at the same time. That's just something I have to accept. I'm, I'm not sure I really could have done that differently, but I would try to look for opportunities to do it in, in the daylight. And about directing Eldon quite strongly, to help him enjoy the experience, I think I have to help him have the maximum freedom that he can to make decisions about what he wants to do. But when I was thinking about it and watching the video of myself, I realised that I was worried about getting the experiment right. But if I am too pushy in how I lead the experiment, then my teammate, which was my boy in this case, it's just going to make him not want to do the experiment at all. So the, for the sake of teamwork, I need to think about how I behave doing this experiment. After the experiment, I remember that making the videos takes a long time. So I, I always think to myself, oh, it'll take about two or three hours and I'll do a quick video. And I also try to get Eldrin to do a bit of this conclusion, this uh, reflection time with me. However, it takes me a long time to do the videos. <laughs> so I need to prioritize which videos are more important to make and which ones are less important. 
because otherwise I'll just end up making videos that are less important instead of focusing on the more important ones. That's just like a real life thing that I have to accept and make decisions with the time that I have. And Eldwin not being interested in the conclusion, well, firstly, uh, I filmed the conclusion uh, quite a few days after doing the experiment. And for a four-year-old boy, that's a long time. And second, Eldwin didn't really understand the experiment in the first place. He just enjoyed doing it and enjoyed having some fun. So really, it was always going to be difficult to get him to, to be interested in doing some conclusion thing like that. So maybe I need to think about how I could have done the conclusion in a more interesting way. Right, well, these are my reflections on my experiment. And my intention here is that you listen to these and you think about how some of these reflections could maybe be similar to your experiences doing your experiments. And I wish you well in that.